good morning, everyone. Our ground round presenter today is uh, Dr. Kevin Jones. Uh, Dr. Jones is an assistant professor in the Department uh, of Pharmacology at the University of Michigan Medical School. His lab work is focused on finding novel therapeutic targets for mental health disorders. Uh, he's specifically um, working uh, on drug abuse, uh, schizophrenia, and depression. Uh, recently, Inside has uh, started a collaboration with Dr. Johns on a research project, and uh, Dr. Ali Aramadan from Inside has been working on a research idea with Dr. Johns, which is what they are going to talk about more today. Um, Dr. Johns, you can start, please. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation, uh, Dr. Beer. Um, this is a project, as, as Dr. Abir mentioned, my lab, we're really electrophysiologists. We study um, glutamate receptors, which I'll talk to you a little bit about in a few moments. But you know, like everyone else, our world has been completely turned upside down, literally by this COVID-19 um, pandemic. And we started to think about how, you know, how we might be able to contribute to some understanding um, about about how this d disease works. Typically in our lab, we do a lot of animal, um, animal model studies of um, drug abuse, schizophrenia, and depression. And so we had been thinking about the molecular uh, components of diseases like schizophrenia for many years. And so as we started to read up some of the literature of what was happening, some of the symptoms of COVID patients, I sort of had this, this hypothesis that was bouncing around my head. And um, serendipitously, I got an email from Dr. Ali al Ramadan, And, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Ali reached out to me and we, 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 we um, over the course of many, many months, we would have um, biweekly meetings where we would just meet, have a Zoom call and just talk ideas, you know, and it's been um, thoroughly enjoyable. I've really enjoyed just um, the, the many hours that we spent talking about science and talking about my work and his interest. And this is sort of a project that we have definitely um, um, developed together. And so from the very beginning, I want to recognize um, Dr. Ali and his uh, important contributions to, to today's seminar. So the title for my grand round seminar is Evaluating Serum from COVID-19 Patients for Psychotomimetic Autoantibodies. And so the outline of the talk, we're going to talk a little bit about a disease called uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis. We'll talk about what NMDA receptors are. Uh, we'll talk about how some of the psychiatric symptoms that um, present in COVID-19 patients, there may be some similarities to NMDA receptor uh, encephalitis patients. And then we have a hypothesis about how COVID-19 might um, put, um, put patients at risk for um, uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis-like symptoms. And then our future directions, the part that I'm really excited about is that um, Dr. Ali and I are developing what we think might be a screening tool to perhaps identify patients that um, might be at risk for developing uh, psychotomimetic symptoms from COVID-19 infections. And so I tip my presentation style is typically very casual. So I do have a um, section at the end of the talk where I'll be glad to engage in comments and dialogue. But if there's something that you don't understand, feel free to raise your hand and I have the chat window open and I will take any questions uh, as we go along. Okay, so the novel Coronavirus COVID-19. Of course, uh, everyone is familiar with this, uh, with this virus by now. It's spread the world and just in the United States, over 250,000 people have died. Over 11 million people have been, have been uh, infected with this virus. And so the name comes from COVID is, a, is an acronym for Coronavirus Disease 2019, of course, when it occurred. Um, the virus is, is originally thought to have um, emerged from Wuhan province in China. It's a, um, top of, a type of SARS um, uh, virus. And we've, you know, the world had its first SARS uh, pandemic back in 2002 when we had the SARS-CoV-1, the inf infamous SARS-CoV-1 pandemic, which only killed about 800, I shouldn't say only, but about 800 people died from SARS-CoV-1 and about 8,000 people got infected. And so the magnitude of the SARS-CoV-2 and uh, SARS-CoV-19 COVID is uh, exponentially more transmissible and is called uh, exponentially more, more, um, uh, more damage. 
So as you know, COVID-19 is primarily a, an infection of the respiratory system. The, the virus is spread through um, airborne particles. It can also be spread through, um, uh, it can also be transmitted through, through touch. But the, the real danger and what's really made the, um, the, the, the virus so deadly and so um, pervasive is that it transmits so readily through the air. Of course, it infects the lungs primarily, but also the trachea and the, um, the nasal passages. And so the primary symptoms, as you're aware, of COVID-19 are, of course, cough, fever, shortness of breath. Um, about 83% of patients develop cough, about 60% um, develop fever, um, a smaller fraction of patients develop shortness of breath, but what's really become so um, insidious is that there's about 40 to 50% of patients that are asymptomatic. And so that's what's really facilitated this, this widespread pandemic and that we are transmitting the virus to our, our friends and neighbors without even uh, realizing it. So in addition to all of the respiratory symptoms, what fascinated me was that there are a subset of patients that also present with neuro neurological symptoms. And some of the neurological symptoms that patients present, there can be a tremendous amount of variance between which symptoms um, the patients present with, but here's sort of the plethora of what they can have. Um, they're relatively common and the, comp and the number of patients that seem to express them um, are growing each day as the virus spreads. They can be on the mild end of the spectrum to something such as headache or dizziness. Um, sometimes you've, you've heard in the media, there's um, lots of uh, reports of patients having um, asnosmia or aguesia, the loss of smell and taste. Um, but there are many patients that present with more um, more concerning neurological complications such as Guillain-Barre -Bar syndrome, encephalitis, meningitis, and a disease called NMDA receptor encephalitis, which I'm going to talk about. So um, my lab really, uh, we are experts on glutamate receptors. Um, glutamate receptors are uh, critical proteins in the brain that mediate everything from sensation to cognition. And there's one particular subtype um, that we think might have a critical role in some of the neurological symptoms of COVID-19. So there's a disease known as NMDA receptor encephalitis, and it is a autoimmune disease where the body generates, NMDA, uh, it generates antibodies against this really important protein in the brain called NMDA receptors. And so there have been several case reports of COVID-19 patients actually presenting with NMDA receptor uh, encephalitis. <clears throat> and so how COVID-19 causes um, neuropathology is not clear. Um, there have been several hypotheses presented and they're not mutually exclusive. One of, the one of the predominant hypotheses is this idea of cytokine storm that you've probably heard about in the media. And so cytokines, of course, are pro-inflammatory molecules released by the brain when uh, it's part of the immune as part of the immune system, and it can cause inflammation throughout the body, and the brain is also susceptible to that. And so there are, is thought to be a, a number of neurological complications that are secondary to the inflammation status that happens during the, during the uh, infection. Um, another interesting idea is that perhaps the virus itself can actually invade the nervous system. And so this is an interesting uh, hypothesis, but to date, there, is, there hasn't been an overwhelming or an abundance of uh, data for this in humans just yet. There, is, there are some preliminary studies showing that you can find virus particles um, in in uh, central nervous system tissue from postmortem patients, there's pretty convincing data in animal models that when uh, viral titers are high, that the uh, virus can make its way into, into the, uh, the nervous system. And so perhaps the virus itself is actually um, having an impact on the physiology of cells within the brain. That could be one source of neuro uh, pathogenesis. And then of course, there are other systemic complications that occur because it's a respiratory disease. These patients uh, very often have uh, hypoxia and coagulation deficiencies that of course can impact the physiology of the brain. Of course, these mechanisms are not mutually exclusive and, you, and patients can have some or all of them. But the, the, the bottom line is we think that 
um, some combination of these different um, neurological complications can lead to um, diseases that have uh, that look, at least on the surface, very similar to a disease called NMDA receptor encephalitis. So NMDA receptor, receptor encephalitis was a relatively unknown disease until about 15 years ago. Um, and uh, it became really, really prevalent in the popular press when a journalist named Susanna Callahan actually came down with the disease. And so she was a writer, I believe, for the New York Times. And so when Miss um, Callahan contracted the disease, she actually wrote a memoir called Brain on Fire, and they actually turned that into a movie. And so what's interesting about the disease is that, to make it simple, is that out of um, very rapidly, patients start to develop symptoms that are similar to schizophrenia. And so um, the, the physicians that were initially treating uh, Ms. Callahan, they thought that she was beginning to develop symptoms or develop, beginning to develop schizophrenia-like symptoms. And so she wasn't responsive to the um, antipsychotic medications. And then eventually they started to uh, track the, the uh, cause of her disease down to, um, she had antibodies against these NMDA receptors that were affecting the physiology of her brain. And so looking retrospectively, we know that this disease mainly affects young people. Um, about 40% of the patients are under the age of 18, and it's much more prevalent in uh, women than in men. Uh, about 80% of the uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis patients are women. Um, about 20 to 30% of them have an underlying tumor. It's very common that they have um, ovarian tumors. And why exactly ovarian tumors lead to this disorder is not clear, but the, the prevailing hypothesis is that these ovarian tumors begin to release um, some proteins as part of the, 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 the uh, cancer or, or as part of the pathogenesis of the tumors. And then the immune system starts to mount an attack against this, these proteins. And just uh, coincidentally, the um, antibodies also recognize an epitope on NMDA receptors. Okay. Another interesting source of uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis is that some patients who have a herpes uh, simplex virus um, uh, uh, infection, after the herpes simplex, uh, after the herpes um, infection subsides, some of these patients can then begin to um, experience symptoms of, in, of NMDA receptor encephalitis. But here's what's really, really fascinating about this disorder. So it's been estimated that about 14% of the population has antibodies against NMDA receptors without any symptoms. So that means perhaps even myself, I could have these antibodies against NMDA receptors, but because these antibodies are restricted to the periphery, um, most, most of these patients, this 14% of the population, they don't exhibit any symptoms. And so after having many, many conversations with Dr. Ali, we developed this idea that perhaps some of the neuropsychiatric symptoms that we see in COVID-19 patients are actually autoimmune related, right? And we think that perhaps what can be occurring is that you have these, um, for example, these cytokine storms that cause inflammatory damage to the blood brain barrier that then allows these antibodies, which are normally restricted to the periphery, um, allows them to enter the blood, uh, enter the nervous system, and then sort of generate some of the uh, neuropsychiatric comp complications that we see. And so this is a cartoon that shows you, uh, let's see if I can, uh, I think this will do the pointer. Yeah, good. So this is a cartoon that shows the blood brain barrier. So the blood brain barrier is this uh, very complex membrane that's um, mainly comprised of uh, epithelial cells within the blood vessels. And there are normally very, very tight protein junctions between the individual epithelial cells that maintain a very strict barrier. And this is important because um, as, you, as you know, um, the environment that the central nervous system operates in um, can have a strong influence on the physiology. And so the blood brain barrier allows the brain to very precisely um, control um, everything from the salt concentrations in the brain to protein levels 
to um, glucose levels, to just a number of different uh, nutrients and small molecules. Um, and so it's made up not only of the, of the um, tight junctions between these epithelial cells, but also the astrocytes play a critical role in ma maintaining a strict blood brain barrier. And so it just allows the brain to have very precise regulation over what proteins and what um, nutrients can enter the brain. So in a normal um, patient, these um, antibodies I have here, they're um, restricted from the, from the uh, central nervous system. But in a patient that's undergoing um, any sort of um, inflammatory response, like an encephalitis, these junctions get disrupted and you start to get um, <clears throat> fenestrations in the basement membranes and within the astrocytes as well. And so it allows these um, antibodies, we're hypothesizing, it allows the antibodies to then gain access to, um, to uh, the, the nervous system. And we think that this could be a mechanism by which COVID can um, generate neuropsychiatric symptoms in some patients. And so my lab studies glutamate receptors. And so glutamate receptors, glutamate is the most prevalent neurotransmitter in the brain. Um, if you look at just about any uh, neuron in the brain, you're gonna find glutamate receptors. So over here on the left, I have a schematic of a uh, pyramidal cell which are the uh, sort of workhorses of the brain. These are the cells that are responsible for learning and memory and cognition. And if you focus in on a little tiny connection between other uh, neurons called a synapse, we can see that on the postsynaptic membrane, we have um, many, many uh, neurotransmitter proteins. And these are the, this is in this cartoon, this is supposed to be glutamate and these are glutamate receptors down uh, at the postsynaptic membrane. And so if you look more carefully, NMDA receptors, like other glutamatergic or like uh, glutamate-gated ion channels, they're tetramers, meaning they're made up of four individual proteins that come together to function as a whole. So this is a crystal structure showing NMDA receptors. And so um, down here at the bottom is supposed to be the intracellular membrane, and this is the extracellular membrane, and this is the ion channel um, the ion channel spreading domain of the protein that actually allows sodium and calcium to come into the channel. But what you'll notice is that the great majority of the protein, about 65% of the protein is actually found extracellular. And so um, this, we think, um, the, we, we believe that the epitopes that the antibodies can recognize are someplace on the extracellular domain of the receptors. And so NMDA receptors, these are some of the, import, the uh, important functions of NMDA receptors. They mediate fast excitatory neurotransmission. Um, they're really, really sort of famous for mediating synaptic plasticity in the form of long-term potentiation and long-term depression, which we think form the molecular basis of learning and memory. So we think that uh, we know that NMDA receptors are critical to uh, learning and memory. In animal models, or even in humans, if you block these receptors, you can block animals from learning many, many types of behaviors. Uh, from a pathological perspective, dysfunction of NMDA receptors have been implicated in many diseases like major depression, Alzheimer's disease, and importantly from my lab, schizophrenia. And so, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we are hypothesizing that some of the autoantibodies um, that have been recognized in NMDA receptor encephalitis patients, and perhaps a subset of COVID patients actually recognize some epitope on one of the NMDA receptor subunits. And so what are some of the clinical manifestations of NMDA receptor encephalitis? So there's a wide range of symptoms, but <clears throat> what's really uh, prominent are that they have psychiatric symptoms. And so this journalist who wrote this book, Brain on Fire, she wrote in really exquisite and really eloquent detail about the hallucinations she began to, um, to experience and some of the delusions. Um, as those symptoms become uh, progressively more um, serious, patients can have loss of consciousness, they can have seizures, they can have memory impairments, and then at the very extreme end of the spectrum, they can actually have autonomic instability and hypoventilation. So it, it's, it can be a pretty severe, some of the consequences of um, these antibodies can be pretty severe. And what we think is that the majority of the um, 
uh, clinical manifestations originate from areas of the brain, such as the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, of course, which is important for, um, for, uh, for, 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 for memory and for consciousness and for um, executive uh, function. Also, and the big tegmental area is another source and also the hippocampus. And so, as I mentioned, most patients that have antibodies against NMDA receptors, um, they don't have any symptoms. And so this can reflect a number of things. This could reflect the, the, the complexity of autoimmune diseases. And it can also affect that there, it, it can also represent that there's a, a multifactorial aspect to it. Patients with severe COVID-19 infection have some elements of damage in the blood brain barrier due to cytokine storm. And um, not only patients with severe COVID-19 um, have inflammatory reactions, but other also patients with mild symptoms could also have uh, uh, inflammatory reactions. And so the aims of this goal, um, what we'd really like to do is to understand whether or not patients that have neuropsychiatric symptoms uh, related with COVID, if these patients have uh, the presence of antibodies for the NMDA receptor in their sera to see if we can make this correlation. And so the goal of this project will be to test if there's an association between the levels of circulating anti-NMDA receptors and the severity of neuropsychiatric symptoms. <clears throat> what um, Dr. Al-Ramadan and I are going to do is to develop an assay to detect whether or not patients uh, COVID-19 patients have um, NMDA receptor antibodies in their serum. And so these are the, this is the approach that we want to take. And so uh, many of you are familiar with the protein called green fluorescent protein. It was derived from the jellyfish and that's green fluorescence protein. The discoverers or the inventors of green fluorescent protein won the Nobel prize about 15 years ago because it's completely revolutionized the way that we do cellular molecular biology. Essentially it's a protein that was discovered in jellyfish. And when you shine UV light on it, it glows green. And so what uh, molecular biologists around the world have done for, for over you know, almost two decades now is you can take the DNA that encodes for green fluorescent protein and you can put it in cells and you can attach it to cells and you can do any number of um, uh, really elegant microscopic um, studies to actually track proteins. And so what I'm showing you here is a new derivative of uh, green fluorescent protein called super ecliptic fluorin. And fluorin is simply a pH sensing fluorescent molecule. And so on the top panel here, what I'm showing you are cells that have been transfected with green fluorescent protein, actually uh, a new revised version called enhanced green fluorescent protein, hence EGFP. And what this is showing you is that the fluorescence intensity of EGFP is stable at different pHs. So at pH 7.2, around physiological pH, this is the sort of intensity that you get. You can see that the green intensity doesn't change even though the extracellular um, solution is decreasing in pH from 7.2 all the way down to pH 5.5. So what some clever evolutionary molecular biologists did was they identified mutations that you can introduce into um, fl green fluorescent protein to make it pH sensitive. And so they named these fluorin, which is a play on word, giving the, the pH sense. So these fluorins at pH 7.2, you can see you get a very robust response. Uh, a, a robust uh, intensity response. But as you reduce the pH, you can see that the intensity of the um, fluorins decrease. And at 6.0 or 5.5, you get very little uh, fluorescence intensity. But what's interesting and clever is that it's reversible. So then if you then revert the, um, the uh, pH back to 7.2, um, a, a vast majority of the fluorescence intensity returns. And so we're going to take advantage of this pH sensing uh, fluorescent molecule to develop an assay that will allow us to uh, probe whether or not COVID-19 patients have antibodies against NMDA receptors in their serum. And here's what we're going to do. So what we're going to do is we've taken uh, the um, subunits that comprise NMDA receptors, and we've attached these um, uh, fluorin, these pH sensing uh, molecules to the protein. And so about 10 years ago, um, 
another scientist at the University of California, um, San Diego, did the hard work of determining where in this very complex protein could you introduce these um, 205 amino acid proteins without disrupting other functions of the protein. And as it turns out, you can introduce it very close to the interminous extracellular uh, terminus of the protein. And so now that we have these proteins, we can then express these proteins in a cell and develop a cell-based assay. And so the cells that we're going to use is a common cell line that we use in our lab are called our human embryonic kidney cells. And so um, in particular, we use HEK293. This is a cell that was um, discovered or uh, actually um, synthesized back in the 1970s, they obtained um, embryonic tissue from an aborted fetus and they transformed it using an adenovirus, um, an adeno, uh, adenovirus uh, particle that integrated into the genome of the cell and allowed it to replicate. And so these are very commonly used cells um, in, in laboratory settings. And what's useful about these cells is that they do not endogenously express NMDA receptors, but if you um, and if you um, and uh, if you transfect them with a plasmid that express a piece of DNA that expresses your protein of interest, they will actually churn it out, and you can use them as a tool. And so we're going to use a process called um, uh, transfection. Um, this is just a cartoon that um, outlines the pro the process of uh, transfection. And basically, what you can do is you can take your a uh, plasmid map, which is a piece of DNA. And in our case, we have a plasmid that has a couple of different elements to it. One, it has a selectable marker. So when you take HEK cells in a Petri dish and you introduce your DNA of interest into them, not every single cell is going to take up your, um, your cell of interest. And so what we've done is we've put a, a red, a different protein called a red fluorescent marker that glows red um, whenever a cell takes that piece of DNA um, into its, uh, whenever it gets um, transfected into the cell. <clears throat> and then additionally, we've added on an antibiotic resistance gene. So what we'd like to do, or what we've actually already started to do, is to generate a stable cell line. And so whenever you do a transfection, um, whenever you introduce DNA into these cells, about one one hundredth of a percent of them will actually integrate that DNA into its genome. And so now every time the cell divides, it will maintain a copy, sometimes multiple copies of your genes of interest. Um, and so what that allows you to do then, that allows you to select for the cells that have stably integrated your DNA of interest and, it, and then you don't have to continuously transfect. And so what we've done is we've introduced a antibiotic resistance um, gene to a molecule, an antibiotic called G418. So G418 is an antibiotic um, that kills mammalian cells. But if you introduce a resistance gene, then the mammalian cells are impervious to the insults of this antibiotic and you can select for them. And so that's what we're doing. So this will allow us to um, make large pools of cells that we can then freeze down and um, store in a freezer and take them out as needed. And so what we're gonna do then is we're going to transfect our hex cells with our NMDA receptors that have the, um, the pH sensing GFP molecule on them. And so when we shine UV light on those, in a microscope, those cells will express, um, will, will give off a very robust green signal. But then as we introduce antibodies that, rep that um, recognize NMDA receptor epitopes, what we found is that when the antibodies bind to the NMDA receptors, it causes them to internalize, okay? And what's interesting about receptor internalization is that, <clears throat> The vacuoles that um, allow proteins to um, be internalized, the pH environment of those vacuoles is very low. In fact, it's on the order of about pH 4.5. And so what happens is that when, uh oh, did I? Can anybody hear me? We can, loud and clear. Oh. 
Okay, sorry. So, yeah, so I, yes, I got a glitch. Is. Okay, all right, good. Okay, so what's what's interesting about this then is the process of um, internalization. The antibodies or all surface membranes um, become vacuolized, and the pH of the vacuoles is very low. And so what you get is a reduction in fluorescence intensity. And so what we're going to do then is use human embryonic uh, kidney cells, transfect them with we have. Um, we have plasmids that encode for the human variants of these uh, gluon-1 subunits, the gluon-2 A subunit, the gluon-2 B subunit, and then we want to develop a high throughput screening assay to detect for receptor internalization um, as a proxy for any antibodies that recognize um, NMDA receptors. Let's see here, my next slide. And so here's the hypothesis. So what we're going to do then, we will grow these cells in mass, and we will grow them in a 96 well dish. And so because these cells uh, express the proteins very robustly, when we shine a UV light on them and look at them under the microscope, we'll see that the majority of these cells will have a, 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 a strong fluorescence intensity. And then the U of M uh, the blood bank here at U of M, which is run by one of my colleagues in the pharmacology department, they've been collecting serum from COVID-19 patients since about March. And they have a cohort of about 5,000 samples from COVID-19 patients. In addition to the samples, they also have the electronic medical records. And so what we're really interested in doing is um, is going through the medical records to identify patients that had very strong neuropsychiatric complications and patients that did not. And then to test our hypothesis, we will get um, small um, samples of the serum and run them in our assay. And so our assay will work like this. This is a um, just a quick video I'm gonna show you of a device that we have in our lab, which is essentially, it's an automated microscope. They gave it the fancy name of a lion heart. But what this, um, what this uh, video shows is that you can run assays in a 96 well plate and this um, device actually has injectors. And so we can have it inject serum. You can see here it's injecting, um, it can inject um, serum into each well, and then we can track the signal over the course of time. And so um, then at the end, the um, software can then generate um, nice data curves for you, and we can track our changes in fluorescence. And our hypothesis is very straightforward. We hypothesize that serum from patients with um, no neuropsychiatric symptoms should not have dramatic changes in fluorescence, and perhaps a subset of those, <coughs> oh, pardon me, and perhaps a subset of those that do have uh, neuropsychiatric complications may um, show a decrease in, um, in, in uh, fluorescence intensity. And so the assay would look something like this. If you were to screen 96 patients, we might see that, you know, there are some patients that have really robust decreases in fluorescence showing NMDA receptor uh, internalization and others won't. And then additionally, we can track the kinetics because what we might find, for example, patients, maybe the, the kinetics, the rate at which the um, receptor gets internalized can actually perhaps reflect the titer of the antibodies in the patient's sera. Or perhaps we may find uh, in, in, in animal studies, we've shown that if you get um, patients, if you get serum from um, NMDA receptor encephalitis patients, there's a wide variety with the intensity which with the patients had symptoms. And we hypothesize that maybe the symptoms correlate with how rapidly it causes internalization. In other words, not all of the antibodies will cause the same degree of internal internalization or the same rate of internalization. And so it's a relatively straight, it's a really relatively straight a uh, straightforward concept. And we think that um, the beauty of this system is that we could actually um, develop a high throughput approach because we have potentially 5,000 samples. And that's not something I, you know, Dr. Ali is interested in joining the lab, but I don't think he wants to pipette 5,000 samples into a 96 well plate for the next 12 months. So the fact that we can develop a high throughput assay, I think is, uh, is uh, appealing to this. And so um, finally, I just like to uh, acknowledge the folks in my lab. Um, I've been very, very fortunate to have just really, really 
brilliant, dedicated, uh, very clever people working for me. Um, these are students and these are um, students and a technician, uh, uh, Mr. Hamza Shakut, that work in the lab. Um, they work on other projects in the lab around electrophysiology and um, uh, uh, other uh, aspects in the lab. Um, some of our former members, um, uh, this is Dr. Heidi Matto. She was a postdoc in the lab and is now has a position working for the uh, National Science Foundation in Washington, DC. And every year, at least pre-COVID, every year our lab is pretty active. We like to go out and hike and camp. And this was a ropes course that we did uh, a couple years ago. Uh, and then of course, finally, I really have to thank uh, Dr. Al Ramadan. Uh, it's just been a joy for our bi-weekly conversations. He's been so influential in the development of this project. I'm just really looking forward to all the things that we're gonna, gonna do going forward, Ali, so thank you. And then uh, finally, I'll, t I'll take any, any questions and thank you for your time. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, I don't know if I can ask a question. I don't, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can, you bet. You can, you can. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, uh, so uh, a very fascinating lecture and it really, it's starting to make me think about the patients that I see that have had COVID. And at the same time, they've, they've developed a degree of psychomotor slowing that I, I am not really understanding why, like, you know, so I, I've seen patients that their saturations drop, they have pulmonary emboli. And I've been thinking more or less that the hypercoagulable state leads them to decreased oxygenation. And then they've got that kind of like post-cardiac surgery, they're just slower, you know? Mm -hmm. But there's been patients that have seen that, that they, they don't, you know, th that didn't happen to them. They didn't have that drop in SATs, but there's, they're not the same person anymore, you know, in terms of just their quickness and sharpness and so on. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, in, in developing uh, these thoughts, uh, of course, uh, the, the genetics, I know people are paying more attention to that, who's more susceptible to these sort of, sorts of things. Um, and so, in terms of a in, in in terms of an in vivo test, is there something you have come across that can then show greater susceptibility in vivo, or is it just through like I'm thinking clinically, like yeah. by that taking samples that we'd be able to do that? That's that's a fascinating question. I, I really like that idea um, a lot. Thank you for that. So um, first, I'm going to start off really narrow. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll expand it broader, more, more broadly. So as it turns out, <clears throat> my area of expertise is in MDA receptors, and we found that there is genetic variability. So there are these large GWAS studies that have been performed, a, a genetic, uh, a genome-wide association studies. And so these are studies that have 50 or 60,000 patients, both in control and experimental. And so doing those studies, we found that there is definitely, a, we can we had definitely identify some risk factors that make people more susceptible to a few uh, mental health disorders. Schizophrenia, I know that literature very well because that's my, that's my, my, my field. But then also, for example, depression or even psychomotor disorders. So I think that, yes, the, the, the short answer to your question is yes. I think that by looking at that GWAS um, information, we might be able to identify some risk factors and then think about how we could incorporate that into the assay. Uh, that's a brilliant idea, uh, you know, leading us towards sort of down the pathway of sort of this personalized medicine that we've all been, been, been kind of dreaming about for the last uh, several decades. Um, so I haven't given it much thought outside of my particular niche, but I have identified mutations in the NMDA receptors that are more susceptible to NMDA receptor encephalitis. And so um, I, I think that to go more broadly, I think that this same concept, the same idea that there are antibodies that are normally excluded from the nervous system that then gain access to other proteins that I haven't talked about. You know, there are thousands of different receptors in the brain disrupting the function of any of them can lead to some of the generalized symptoms you mentioned. And so I'm wondering if we should start to give broader thought to thinking about um, what other um, antibodies against targets in the brain some of these um, COVID patients might have floating around their, 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 their bloodstream prior to infection. <laughs> 